everybody. Uh, welcome to our Friday seminar. Uh, we have some great folks from NREL here today, Keith Whipke and Misha Penev. Uh, Keith is the, I uh, have my little cheat cards, the fuel cell, fuel cell and hydrogen technologies lab manager. Misha is one of their lead uh, research scientists there. Uh, I actually did go on uh, LinkedIn, so if, when you see that you have another profile view of who is this person, I was writing all these things down. In fact, I, that, that's my comedy routine. I was looking and I was going, wow, you know, Keith has been there 21 years, he has a Master of Science, he went to Stanford, right, doing this good. Yeah. UC Santa Barbara, wish I got to go to school there. Uh, Michel, uh, been, been at NREL for uh, seven years, uh, Master of Science from Union College, and you guys had chemical engineering and really impressive CVs and great work that's going on uh, down there. And what I thought, and I said I'd keep it to a minute so everyone that knows me knows it will be at least three minutes, <coughs> that uh, the reason we're all here and where this came about from, about three months ago, there was a kickoff meeting at NREL for uh, an initiative called the Colorado Hydrogen Coalition, which is a group of, uh, obviously, NREL, uh, auto manufacturers, people from government, all these various stakeholders. And the objective is to bring, and find a, a way to bring uh, fuel cell powered cars into the Colorado marketplace without having something called ZEV mandates, which are zero emission vehicles. So it would have to be based on uh, econ just economics. I mean, it'd have to be uh, some incentives from uh, the state government, but it, it pretty much has to stand on its own. All carrot, no stick. And so I've been working with these nice guys down at NREL for coming up on three months now and uh, various other partners. And I ran into Bob and uh, I was somehow just saying, you know, what we were doing down there. And he's like, oh, that would be a great Friday talk. So I reached out to Keith and I said, hey, would you guys mind coming up and uh, giving a presentation about state of the art and fuel cell research? And uh, I can you into it, bring one of those cool fuel cell cars with me. And, and sure enough, I don't know if you guys came in that way, but you'll see this Toyota Highlander, which is a, I, know, I think we might refer to it as a technology demonstration vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it's not product, it's not production ready, but it reflects production, cap pretty much production capability. I think that's a good way. Yeah. And uh, and if we're lucky, and I get off the stage, which I'm going to now, uh, <coughs> Keith will give his presentation. We'll have uh, some time for Q and A. And uh, then we'll go take a look at the, the fuel cell car, and maybe we can do a little bit of ride and drive time. So with that, Great. thank you so much, Keith. Sounds good. Yep. <coughs> <Let's see. coughs> So thanks for uh, having me here, Steve. I always like talking about this. And actually, I was just at Toyota in Torrance yesterday uh, giving a very similar talk. And uh, had some good questions and good interaction as they prepare to launch their fuel cell car. Um, so if there's things that come up as I'm talking, you know, let, let me know. Uh, let's ask, ask it and answer it at the time. It's, it's easier than holding it up to the end. Um, small enough group, uh, we can easily do that. Um, so. You know, what's going on in fuel cell vehicles and hydrogen in particular? You may hear about it in the news, and I want to just give you some background on why things are kind of bubbling up right now and, and why you should care, uh, why this is going to become more relevant for you. So um, this is from NPR. This is January 2nd. Uh, it's all things considered, I think. Um, and I, didn't, I, I, I was interviewed back in late November or December uh, by, um, uh, what was his name, um, Richard Harris. Um, he travels all over the world, does Afghanistan, all kinds of science stuff. And um, he basically followed me around with a fuzzy mic for an hour at NREL. And we drove in the fuel cell car. I had no idea if it would ever get to the radio or not. And <clears throat> in, in this day in January, my Facebook page starts lighting up with all these posts from people, you know, my hundred, you know, people from high school that I, you know, see, but I don't really know. And they're like, dude, you're on the radio, you know, and these are, I grew up in Santa Cruz, so kind of surfer slang and all that. Um, and so, uh, you know, for, for me, that was just kind of, uh, it was one on my bucket list. I, I love NPR and all things considered and all this. And so to be on that was, was really um, cool for me. But the reason why that happened and the reason why I bring it up here is there's things going on within the car companies right now. And they've been going on for the last 20 years. But they're actually now, we are now like the, the Prius was 
as a, as a concept and uh, getting ready to launch in 1998. So that's kind of where things were with a Prius. In that case, it was launched in, in Japan only uh, it, for, a, for a year or two. Then it came to the US, and then they changed the body style in 2004, and that's really when it took off. So um, the, the code name they've used for the vehicle at, at Toyota is, I think, Mariah or Mirai or something like that, which means future. Prius means to come before. And so um, they're very serious about that. And so Toyota, Honda, and Hyundai, and I'll talk about this more later, are all getting ready to launch or are launching fuel cell cars today in California. So that's one thing. Uh, this is from Fast Company Magazine. Did a nice interview, same thing. They came and drove around up to our fuel cell um, refueling station up the wind site, um, you know, five miles south of here. And it was a nice interview, and then I didn't know they were going to kind of uh, juxtapose it against electricity in this kind of box, boxing ring match uh, approach. But that's, that's really how the media likes to frame things, is everything is a, a drama, you know, or a, a competition uh, between things and, and the, the tension. And so this is basically Toyota um, had invested in uh, Tesla and the RAV4 electric vehicle that was launched in California for, I don't know, a few hundred of those had um, Tesla drivetrain uh, and, and batteries in there. And basically, Toyota now said, OK, we're, we're kind of done with that. And the media grabbed onto that and said, oh, Toyota's working on fuel cell cars. And they're backing out of the deal with Tesla. So therefore, it must mean you know, this or that. And uh, in some cases, yes. In other cases, uh, it was just a business deal. But the reality is um, Toyota is, is fully all in on hydrogen and fuel cells, and are, as are some of the other car companies. So uh, you'll get that sense. So then uh, you know, Tesla is kind of uh, using this opportunity to state their position on it. Uh, this article is written by Joe Rome, who about a decade ago was beating this drum against hydrogen, right when the, the Bush initiative was starting, uh, the hydrogen initiative. And so, you know, they're basically uh, claiming that uh, hydrogen fuel cell, he calls them, uh, Elon Musk calls them hydrogen fools cells rather than fuel cells. Um, so very, you know, aggressively antagonistic toward the technology. Um, and so, you know, there's, there is this controversy and, and it's getting stoked by people like Joe Rome, who wrote a book called The Hype About Hydrogen. He used to work for the uh, U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and then uh, also other things going on in the news. Um, Hyundai uh, launched the Tucson fuel cell vehicle in California uh, this spring, so it's on the road now. Um, and it's 500 bucks a month, including fuel, hydrogen fuel and maintenance. Uh, pretty aggressive pricing which now kind of sets a bar for other comp companies that maybe want to compete head to head in this particular price point. Um, and so this is, uh, and you can see who they're targeting here, early adopters, be the first to park one in your driveway. Um, not, you know, this is the cheapest car or, you know, th these are early adopters they're, they're targeting. Uh, yes? I'm sure you'll get into the whole yeah. infrastructure ideas, but when they say, you know, 500 bucks a month including fuel, yeah. just basic question. They have eight retail-like stations today, and they're on their path up to 100 um, by 2025, uh, I think, or 2020. All so, in Orange County or no, 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 uh, the Bay Area as well. So, um, basically, the California Energy Commission has funded 100, the first 100 stations at roughly two, two million dollars a pop, so 200 million dollars over the next decade from a uh, car registration tax. And then just for basic knowledge for those of us who aren't familiar with fuel cell cars, how often do you have to fill up once a week? Uh, same as gasoline. So they'll size the hydrogen tanks on here to give you a three to 400 mile range. Okay, perfect. Yep, yep. And then you'll get a three minute refuel. Are the oil companies on board? Um, not right now. They were back when it was the Bush Initiative. Um, and so who's the gas station, the fuel station? Right now it's industrial gas suppliers, Air Products, Air Liquide, um, companies that basically um, deliver nitrogen, air. Uh, what's that? Hydrogen to the lab, now hydrogen to the consumer. Yeah, I mean, they're, they, ultimately they're not going to be the, probably the, the supplier, but that's who's doing it right now because they have the experience and the, the safety know-how and all that. So that is one question is who's going to step in and kind of fill that void. Uh, let's see. And then one uh, final kind of in the news thing, um, and I added this for, for you guys, your audience here. Um, you know, hydrogen has unique properties, especially when it comes to energy density relative to batteries. And so if you want long uh, flight time, here's a, a couple, here's from uh, Air Environment and, and Boeing, you know, basically hydrogen powered aircraft that can go up, do, 
you know, maybe it's uh, the next hurricane, one of these things goes up there and just becomes a, sat, uh, you know, a, a cell tower repeater over that location for first responders and emergencies. Um, or obviously you can monitor uh, battlefields and things like that. Yes? You know, we're, we're building the fuel cells for the, I mean, the, the fuel tanks for, for Okay, Boeing. I did not know that. For which one? For the I Boeing one? We won that, but for the Boeing? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, li liquid hydrogen. Yeah. Energy, energy density compared to uh, the kind of batteries that are used in that. Uh, well, I'm sorry, energy density compared to, say, gasoline. Ah, um, not so good. Um, I'm trying to remember the number. Misha, do you remember? Is it a tenth or? Yep, that sounds about right. I mean, liquid water has more hydrogen than, than liquid hydrogen, just because the covalent bonds kind of pull it in tighter. Um, it's, but in it's terms of mass, in terms of density. Yeah, no, energy density is very good. Yeah, yeah. it's much better than anything else. Yeah. That's why it's on the aircraft. Right, right, right. Um, what form is it in the car? High, uh, gaseous. Uh, 700 bar, 10,000 PSI or 700 bar. Yeah, very high pressure. And I'll talk about safety in a bit. Um, so, okay, so that's just kind of the, the intro of <coughs> why why you might be interested in this and why it's in the news now. Uh, this is just the outline of my talk. Give a little bit about Enron in case you don't know much about us. Um, talk about the basics of uh, hydrogen fuel cells and how you fuel the, the vehicles. Um, give some market context to the vehicles that are coming out and what, what those are. Um, where do you get the hydrogen from? That's a logical question. How much does it cost? Um, how do you power uh, fuel cell cars with renewable energy? And that's what we're doing at Enron. Um, how we're working with industry to advance these cars coming to market. A couple initiatives and challenges, what needs to be done still. And I've got one uh, slide for kind of key takeaways, uh, if, if there's anything you should remember from today. Okay, so about NREL. So we're just down the road, 25 miles, um, right south of uh, South Table Mountain, uh, right around the corner from Coors. Um, we are actually, uh, the buildings and all the equipment and our laptops are owned by the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. However, we're not government um, employees. So last year when the government shut down, we didn't have to go home. We had money in the bank to continue operating. Um, we're actually employed by the Alliance for Sustainable Energy, uh, which is a 50-50 LLC um, uh, from Battelle and MRI Global, which is, used to be Midas Research Institute at Kansas City, Missouri, uh, which actually NREL is larger than their laboratory in, in Kansas City. Uh, about 2,400 staff, um, 350 active uh, partnerships with, with outside uh, non-DOE activities, and actually our campus is a living model of sustainable energy. Um, all of our buildings are now LEED Platinum rating, uh, including our laboratory buildings. Um, this is part of our research support facility, which was, I think, our first LEED Platinum building on our campus. Um, actually includes a lot of technologies that were developed at NREL over the last 35 years, which is really cool. Uh, and this is an aerial view. Uh, showing uh, the RSF, the three wings, and then our new energy systems integration facility, which is a uh, leading state-of-the-art building for grid interconnection, and that's also where our hydrogen activities are housed. So uh, to kind of give an intro of, of our view of a portfolio of options for um, vehicle technology. So if you look at today's vehicle, um, it's about a uh, gasoline vehicle, three to 350 uh, grams per CO2 per kilometer. Um, and if you look at uh, what's needed to get down to sustainable uh, environmental levels for CO2 emissions, you need about an 80% reduction from today's baseline. And this is a constant uh, gram per CO2 uh, um, uh, curve. And so you can either make your vehicles more efficient, uh, like the Prius does, you know, two or three times the, the fuel economy of a regular vehicle, or you can lower the carbon intensity of the fuel, or you can do both. Um, and so uh, these are just some representative curves of where biofuels come in. You can really get the, the carbon content out of that, at least in a full uh, fuel cycle. Uh, but ultimately, you're doing combustion engines typically, so you're not going to be that efficient. You can do electric, which is very efficient, but has uh, a little bit higher energy intensity based on the mixture of fuels that are on that grid. And then there's hydrogen, which is somewhere in the middle, uh, more efficient um, and uh, lower uh, carbon intensity. Uh, than in either of those two. So on our campus, uh, this is a picture of one of the uh, Prius plug-in 
uh, prototypes, we actually got, um, once they were done testing those and they launched their product, we got 20 of those vehicles at NREL. Um, so on our campus, we have a bunch of different vehicles. Uh, they're powered by electricity, hydrogen, ethanol, um, E85, um, natural gas, all kinds of different fuels. Uh, we have various fueling and recharging stations. All of our electricity um, comes from solar and wind, or if necessary, we buy renewable energy credits to basically balance out uh, and become 100% uh, renewable. And we also have that, uh, energy infrastructure to allow the electricity re return energy back to the grid. It's really there for our renewables, but we're actually doing some experiments with uh, plug-in hybrids and vehicle to grid, where you actually power the grid at least uh, a little bit from your vehicle. Um, so the, the program I manage at NREL is uh, a fuel cell and hydrogen technologies program. So it's not just fuel cells and vehicles, it's the whole spectrum going all the way from making the hydrogen, storing it on board, um, converting it to electricity on board, uh, and then trying to get, um, these are kind of cross cut, making sure that the fuel cells as you make them have high quality control to try and drop the costs. Uh, we do technology validation of things out in the field. Um, also a market transformation, basically looking for new market niches to expand the role of hydrogen fuel cells. And then safety codes and standards to basically make sure that the market is ready and the fire marshals and everybody's comfortable with the safety aspects of it and that the products that are being made fit into that mold of, of safety. And then finally systems analysis that kind of cuts across um, all of those. Okay, so some of this may be really basic for some of you, maybe it's, it's new, uh, but just kind of ground everybody when we're talking about this. Um, hydrogen atom is one proton, one electron, and the periodic table of elements is in the upper left. Um, so, you know, basically it's normally exists um, as a molecule as H2, uh, two hydrogen um, atoms, so you got two protons and two electrons, um, and it combines easily with other elements. So on Earth, you don't see it like this unless you make it really. It's in combinations such as water, which is H2O, methane, CH4, and biomass, which is more complex uh, carbon uh, uh, molecules. And so, um, you know, basically when one of the main forms of making hydrogen we do from renewables is through electricity, splitting water into H2 and O2. Um, and so that's, that's you know, one of the, the simplest ways to do it. So how do you do a fuel cell vehicle? Um, you're all familiar with uh, um, hybrid vehicles like the, the Prius, um, and basically you're only providing liquid fuel on board. You're not providing any electricity externally. All the electricity on board is actually made from your internal combustion engine and a generator and then also regen braking when you, when you slow down. Uh, a plug-in hybrid is basically the same thing. However, you allow electricity to come from off-board. And if it's, you're gonna do that, you wanna make it worth your while, so you basically make a bigger battery pack. These battery packs on the Prius are maybe one kilowatt hour, or one kilowatt for one hour. Not a whole lot of energy. But for a hybrid, buffering the energy, that's fine. For a plug-in, if you're gonna go to all that work and have an inverter and all that, you wanna make it you know, a significant amount of energy. So for example, uh, um, some of the, uh, um, what's the Hybrids Plus, or there's a company in Boulder that does this, um, and I, I can't remember how many kilowatt hours they have on there, but it's you know dozens, uh, maybe 20 or 30. Um, and just for reference, the, the Tesla Model S um, has, uh, their biggest is 85 kilowatt hours, so a very large battery pack. Um, and then finally, a fuel cell vehicle, the only input is hydrogen, and it's as gaseous form and you store it in a high pressure tank, uh, it runs through the fuel cell which makes electricity, uh, and then you either store that or you run the motor, and of course you have regen braking as well. All fuel cell vehicles today are hybrids. They have batteries on board. The hybrid battery is much the same size as a hybrid gasoline hybrid. They're not big batteries. Um, people have talked about doing a plug-in um, hydrogen fuel cell hybrid. Uh, which is basically a combination of these two, a bigger battery pack. And it's possible, but you're already sticking a lot of technology on there, um, a big big tank for the hydrogen, and have a big battery as well. You're talking about more cost, more weight. And from my discussions with the auto companies, they say, if we're going to all the trouble to get all this stuff on here for a fuel cell vehicle, if we want more energy, we'll just stick a bigger hydrogen tank on there. It's much, much lighter and easier to package that than it is you know, 500 pounds worth of batteries. So that's kind of their perspective with today's technology, at least. Is that part of the drive for them, for Toyota, um, is I'd say the generally expensive batteries. Well, in general, um, they don't like batteries. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of reasons why. 
um, mass and handling, um, uh, degradation of the batteries. Um, and, but really their biggest thing is from the consumer perspective, they, they, they really truly believe in the voice of the customer and who's buying their product. And to change people's paradigm about driving range and refueling time, which are the two biggest things that you sacrifice when you have an all electric battery electric vehicle, even a Tesla, even with the supercharger stations, um, you sacrifice range and refueling time with a battery electric vehicle. And just for reference, when you're pumping gasoline, that's about two megawatts worth of energy going through as a liquid fuel. So if you want to replicate that with electricity, think about a two megawatt cable. And if you want eight or 10 people to fuel at your corner Conoco station on Table Mason Broadway, you're talking about 10 people doing two megawatts apiece. You're talking about 20 megawatts and its own little substation or distribution thing for each one of those corner stations. For me, it does, that doesn't make sense. So, um, but, you know, uh, Tesla is doing this with the superchargers and basically they're trying to eliminate that as a, as a threshold. But still, you're talking about a 20 minute fueling of maybe 50% or 80% of your charge. And if you do that, I guarantee you, if you do that every day because you're lazy and you don't want to plug in at home, um, you will tear up that battery in um, months, if not uh, weeks. I mean, it's, you're talking about I, square R, I squared R losses and, and the current is so high to do that you've got heat generation, it's gonna, it's gonna rip it apart, so. Um, so just kind of going a little bit further on these, these uh, technologies that are within the, the vehicle. Um, this is a, a generic vehicle, it doesn't represent any, any OEM's vehicle. Um, here's a, a, what you would consider a small hybrid battery, uh, probably under the floor where they are in normal, more normal uh, hybrids. Uh, one or two or maybe three hydrogen storage tanks, they're gonna be, because it's high pressure, they're gonna be rounded, cylindrical or spherical. Um, and you know they'll be packaged in a safe place uh, to try and shield them as much as possible from impact. And then you've got uh, basically the fuel cell somewhere up front. There's also going to be an inverter to take the DC to go to AC to power your motor. Uh, there will be an electric motor. You'll have uh, a couple radiators to dissipate the heat, and and that's it. And the nice thing about um, fuel cell as well as battery electric vehicles is all your power is getting transferred by electricity. So you're talking about wires. You're not talking about drive shafts and torque. And so if you want to stick your fuel cell up here or under the floor or in the back or in a tunnel, it's the same. It's just a, a maybe a little bit longer or shorter electrical run with wires. So tremendous flexibility from a new product, uh, clean sheet design if you're an <coughs> automotive company. You can think about different concepts. And you know, as, as Tesla did with the Model S, where you've got a, a large trunk up front. Um, because you don't have an engine up there. So it's, you know, it's a different paradigm when you start dealing with electricity to transfer your power than when you're dealing with shafts that have to be kind of straight or at right angles and rotating and, and all that. So it's, it's kind of a cool paradigm shift. Um, so basically once you have the hydrogen on board, um, you, you, uh, you take the protons, they go through the proton exchange membrane. And so remember a, a, a proton electron, you let the proton go through and that that's split apart through a catalyst on an electrode and a special membrane, kind of like saran wrap. Um, and then the electron goes around and this is where you put your motor or your battery and you do uh, electrical work with it. And then it comes back around here and it joins back up with a proton and oxygen from the air and you form H2O. So the byproducts of a fuel cell are water, uh, heat, and electricity. And that's it. Um, so what do these things actually look like? Um, this is from a Honda FCX. This is back before they did the Clarity. Um, so this had a Ballard fuel cell stack from up in Canada. Um, they actually did a sandwich floor construction, so all the components were in the floor of the car. Um, they chose to go <coughs> with uh, two uh, big tanks, but they were also at 350 bar, so half the pressure of today's vehicles. Um, and they just made a very, very efficient vehicle, very aerodynamic, very lightweight. And so they went through it with 350 bar and got a decent range. I think it was 200 and something miles on, on, at 350 bar. And now their next generation vehicle um, is at 700 bar and will have 300 plus mile range. I yeah. Remember, is the Highlander out there, can it handle 700 bars? Or it is, it is, yep. And it actually holds, uh, I think it has four tanks, um, two in front of the axle and two uh, behind and stores about six kilograms. In fact, this is, this is the vehicle. Uh, so this is uh, two vehicles. These vehicles came out 
um, in 2008-2009, and uh, Toyota started making claims about the driving range of these vehicles in excess of 300 miles, which at the time, uh, and still is, DOE's target for the whole program was fuel cell vehicles with 300 plus mile range. And so, um, I think it was Andy Card at the time, some high level person within DOE said, I don't believe it, I, I wanna know for sure. I, I don't trust their data, I wanna, I wanna know uh, with our guys that this is true. So, um, it was kind of a challenge to us as a national lab to say, we'll go out and verify their data. So, uh, with, in conjunction with Savannah River, who happened to have um, a contract in place with Toyota at the time, we went out and we drove from uh, Toyota's headquarters in Torrance up to downtown LA, over to Santa Monica, and all the way down the coast and along the I-5 to San Diego. We had a very late lunch at about 2.30, uh, turned around and drove back exactly 180 degrees, the same route. So it was about 50-50, uh, city driving, highway driving, and we drove in about 10 or 10 and a half hours, uh, 330 miles. These are data from the two vehicles. Uh, we consumed 4.8 kilograms, which is like 4.8 gallons of gasoline equivalent, and we still had about 1.4 to 1.5 uh, kilograms left in the tanks, which was about 100 miles left. And so we drove 330 miles, about 100 miles left in the tank, so our calculation was that these vehicles were capable of 430 mile range without refueling on one tank of hydrogen, or one fill up of hydrogen, which had never been um, objectively verified before. And so this is a public report out on our website if you want to see the data. <coughs> Um, so that's kind of long driving range is one aspect of the vehicles. Another aspect is uh, high efficiency. So I was in uh, the lead for a project for nine years uh, where we gathered data from four different car companies and their fuel cell vehicles over five years. Uh, we did 300 or 3 million miles worth of uh, uh, data that came to NREL, we evaluate, evaluated. And so we, this is the efficiency as a function of power from the fuel cell. And one unique aspect of fuel cell technology is a very broad and flat efficiency curve. And so this is ba basically the range, the light green is generation one, dark green is generation two, the range of the highest and the lowest of those four car companies uh, stacks, um, uh, you know, without attribution to which company is, is on the upper or lower end. And so DOE's target at the time was 60% efficiency. We actually got up to, I think, 59%, very, very close, and, and basically validated that the efficiency can be that high. Uh, so that's another, another attribute of fuel cell is high conversion efficiency on board the vehicle. And then I've got a couple pictures here of some state-of-the-art stations. Uh, this is in uh, Torrance, California, right across the street from Toyota and Lexus uh, headquarters in California. These are the two, uh, two of the Honda Clarity vehicles uh, at 350 bar. So this side of the island is 350 bar fueling. The other side is uh, 700 bar, so the Toyota vehicles are over there. You can also see Mercedes-Benz, um, uh, Hyundai Kia, Daimler, and uh, uh, there's a Hyundai Tucson here as well. And this is a unique station because it's a pipeline field station. So right around this area, um, even though there's nice beaches and all that, there's refineries. Big um, tankers come in from wherever, they bring oil, and they refine it into gasoline. Well, they use a lot of hydrogen to do that. And so Air Products has a big steam methane reforming hydrogen plant a couple miles away from here. So the pipeline actually runs right down this street. So all they did was tap into it, bring it over here, uh, they clean up the hydrogen, then they compress it, and then they fuel the vehicles with it. And so it's a pretty small footprint for the hydrogen stuff at this site. Very, very unique relative to other ones, if you've seen them. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's the whole fuel cell system, so including all balance of plant, compressors, all that, but we drew the box around the system. So hydrogen in to electricity out. So once you got electricity out, it can go to the batteries, go to the wheels, but that's the conversion from hydrogen to electricity. And, and nowadays, from what I hear anecdotally, they're up in the, in the 70s uh, in terms of efficiencies. Um, so this is a different view of that Shell Hydrogen Station in Torrance, just show, showing some of the components there. Um, a 700 bar nozzle pistol grip, actually I think on the next slide um, I've got a better picture of that. So you can see you, you basically squeeze it like a normal gasoline dispenser and when you do that you um, actuate this um, clamping that's kind of a uh, concentric, it, it wraps around and grabs on and makes an, a gas tight seal. Uh, trying to make it as much like a conventional vehicle uh, fueling as possible. 
It is, yes. The Society of Automotive Engineers has standardized that for both 350 bar and 700 bar. And it's downward compatible, so you can fuel a 700 bar vehicle at 350 bar, but you can't go the other way to make sure you never put higher pressure hydrogen into your tank. So here I've got just a, uh, a two and a half minute uh, YouTube video, um, uh, unpaid actors, uh, uh, script made up on the fly, uh, but it shows some of the basic parts of fueling a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle and also has some nice scenery of our, our fueling station up at the wind site. Um, so I'll see if this works again. So we're driving a 2010 Kia Brego fuel cell vehicle and we're on our way from NRL's campus in Golden up to our wind site. Oops. We're going to get some more uh, hydrogen fuel uh, made from renewables from wind and solar. What did I do? And something around here. I've got t I had two windows open, it looks like. Okay, let's try this again. So we're driving a 2010 Kia Brego fuel cell vehicle, and we're on our way from NRL's campus in Golden up to our wind site. Where we're going to get some more uh, hydrogen fuel yes. Uh, yes. made from renewables from wind and solar. That's a wind turbine blade in the background being tested statically with weights on it, sticking out in the back. So tell me a little bit about this car, do you? Well, it's a Kia Borrego fuel cell car. It's uh, got a 110 kilowatt fuel cell. It has uh, ultra capacitor rather than batteries to give it its extra power. And uh, we're about ready to go here. We're good to go. And how many miles a gallon does this, does this get? Well, it's supposed to get about 55 to 60 miles per gallon, and we're seeing right around that uh, through driving it here at NREL. As you can tell, it's pretty quiet. You can barely tell it's on. Got some good pickup? Yeah. There's a cop. <laughs> So you get to see some of the uh, <coughs> components there without needing to go to the wind site. Yeah, I've got some slides on that. <coughs> okay, so what's going on in the market? Um, I talked a little bit about the utility of the vehicles and um, my, my view is that um, we will have a portfolio of technologies. Um, battery electrics are really good at the short distance, uh, zero emission, um, high efficiency of the whole cycle. Um, and so small electric vehicles I think are great. Um, and you know, but this isn't a car for everybody and not everybody can afford to have a, a car that you only use for one purpose. Um, and so fuel cells uh, basically are able to do the highway driving, um, basically replace every powertrain <coughs> in, in every class of vehicle that's out there. So you could, you could have a Toyota Sequoia um, towing a, a boat up to Lake Dillon on I-70, going 70 miles an hour, go up there and come back and without refueling. That'd be very, very difficult to do in a battery electric vehicle, just from the weight of the batteries, um, from uh, everything about that. And so that is really, from my view, one of the most compelling reasons why the car companies are interested in fuel cell technologies is because they can actually put it in any vehicle and sell it to any person who's in that market. Whereas a battery electric vehicle um, or even a plug-in hybrid, 
you really need to start asking questions about um, whether you live in a house or an apartment, um, how many spare sockets do you have in your house, are you close to the current limit of your fuse box, all those kinds of things are things um, that aren't insurmountable, but they're just questions that dealers have never had to ask customers before. And it's a little bit uncomfortable uh, for them given that they're not all electrical engineers or electricians. Right. They'll say, I don't know. Right. Right. And they're also not used to paying for infrastructure in their house in the tune to of, of five to $10,000 for some of this equipment. Um, so the other thing that's going on is there's a lot of technology development. So this is a, um, a fuel cell patent index. Um, and basically, this is the number of patents per uh, quarter in these technologies. You see fuel cell, uh, solar, tidal wave, um, wind. And so fuel cell has been dominating for the last decade um, in, a, in a, about a five or six factor over these other technologies. Um, and it wasn't until Obama administration right around here uh, with stimulus money where you see a lot of the solar and wind uh, start to come into play uh, in a bigger way. They have uh, solar's caught up to fuel cells. Uh, wind is about half that. And so this just tells you strategically where companies are investing money and where they're placing bets on new technology. And you can see the top 10 companies, GM, Honda, Samsung, Toyota, UTC Power, Nissan, Ballard, Plug Power, Panasonic, and Delphi. So these are automotive related companies, but also other companies um, that are interested in um, energy technologies in general. And it's dominated by the United States and Japan, and then uh, Germany here. So this is just kind of a forward view of <coughs> what's coming in the pipeline, because normally you try and lock up that IP uh, many years before you actually come to the market with product. Thank you. Before yeah. we go on two slides back, um, you had the, the continuous, the kind of semi-transport industry. Is there a play for fuel cells in that industry as well? In, in the heavy trucks? Yeah. Um, buses, for sure. Um, it makes a lot of sense for buses. Um, they centrally fuel, um, they're often, um, well, they're highly visible, they're transporting people, um, and they're also often used by and going through uh, socio-disadvantaged -disad places and people. And so um, there's a social justice movement, and it's pretty strong in California, where you know the people taking the buses are on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum in general, except for, for example, going from Denver to Boulder or, or vice versa. But in general, that's who's taking the bus. Um, and so those buses are going through those places and they're getting the diesel fumes and the noise and all that. And so fuel cells are a way to actually serve those people in a positive way, socially, environmentally. And that's unusual that you can do that um, and, and do it uh, by displacing you know, uh, petroleum at the same time. So it's kind of a win-win. Uh, and then also the fueling of the vehicles is easier. So this is, uh, AC Transit has a dozen of these vehicles in Emeryville. Um, the fueling station is actually right across the street from Pixar. Um, and there's a school on the other side of it. Um, and so uh, fuel cells uh, in buses make a lot of sense. Heavy trucks, maybe, maybe not. Maybe if you did liquid hydrogen, um, they're actually looking at you know, natural gas and, and liquefied natural gas is a good solution for long haul trucking to displace uh, oil or you know, diesel fuel. Um, so, so maybe, but I wouldn't say that would be the first, first market. I think buses and cars are, are gonna be the first movers there. So in terms of product coming to market, um, I already showed you the, in the intro, um, Hyundai's vehicle that's out on the market now. Um, Toyota and Honda are the next two. And I just heard something a couple days ago, I couldn't quite decipher if I, I believed it or not, but it said something about Honda coming to market in 2016. So they may be shifting back by a year. Uh, but this is their um, um, vehicle, uh, their sedan, uh, which is a little less aggressive than the concept you may have seen a few months ago, uh, probably at the LA Auto Show. This is Toyota's vehicle. Um, this is, uh, uh, it looks like we'll, we'll be getting one of these at NREL uh, next year. So maybe we'll come back and do a, another uh, uh, talk in, uh, next year when we've got that vehicle. But you can see all the major OEMs um, that have significant market share are playing in this market and they're all talking about fuel cell vehicles on the road in the next five years. Um, and many of them have joint uh, partnerships, for example GM and Honda and Ford and Nissan uh, to basically lower the costs and lower the threshold of pain to bring a new technology to market. Toyota's 
cell technology, maybe like an IA like follow on or something. Right. Like there, is, there is a partnership, a public partnership between uh, BMW and, and Toyota. What they're doing with that, I, I don't know or can't say. Um, so, the, um, so those companies we just had on the previous slide make up 81% of the market share. So these are the people, if you want to make an impact and, and displace oil, these are the right people to be doing it. So in terms of infrastructure, uh, there's a lot going on around the world. However, it is concentrated in a few countries. Uh, Germany has a strong commitment. Um, and this is with Daimler rolling it, Mercedes-Benz rolling out vehicles there. They've made a statement about 1,000 stations by 2020. That's pretty aggressive. Uh, Japan government has said uh, uh, introduction in 2015 with sufficient stations to support those early vehicles. Uh, Korea is talking about 100 stations in 2020. Denmark is just getting into this as well as Norway. And in the US, uh, there have been a number of uh, states demonstrating stations and technology. Uh, there are actually 58 stations across the US, mostly behind the gate. Uh, behind the fence. And then uh, California, New York, New York, and Hawaii uh, are probably the most active. And the California, I already talked about, uh, uh, Energy Commission has uh, committed $200 million over 10 years to get to that first 100 stations, which the car companies have said is sufficient um, uh, coverage to s fuel those vehicles. Not enough capacity to really make a significant penetration, but enough coverage. Um, and then, you know, there's other uh, states and, and federal level for, for fueling stations is uncertain at this point. I just want to show, uh, uh, this is the Newport Beach fueling station um, a couple miles from Balboa Island, uh, very uh, um, upscale uh, neighborhood. And they took and um, converted one or two islands here to hydrogen. And it looks so much like a regular gasoline station. You'd have people coming up, and this happened when I went to go visit the station. People coming up, and they'd pull up, and they'd get out, and they'd pop their lid, and then they'd stare at this, this thing and look for where to swipe the card, and it just didn't quite look the same. They kind of step back and look around, and I said, why are these people so confused? It says hydrogen. Don't they get it? And then I looked, and on the next island over, just right over here, there was a big banner about clean fuel with nitrogen. Right? Something about, uh, you know, I don't know what it was, and a uh, cleanser or something they had in the fuel. And so it's no, no surprise we're confusing people. We're throwing around all kinds of science terms to try and impress them. And when, and they don't really understand it and they don't really care. They just say, oh, it must be good for me. It must be good for my car. So when they see hydrogen, it doesn't even, they don't even pause. Just another thing that the, the oil that company, gas yeah, <laughs> trying to distinguish the product from the guy across the corner who has a different detergent in their fuel. A real basic question. Yeah. that's built into the lease and structure like that. So how does it move from it's included in the lease to I need to fill up and I'm not, you know, I'm a standalone customer without right. that? Right. So the, the new fueling stations are, you know, credit card uh, oriented. These ones are kind of like more like touch screen pin number um, focus because it was a real limited audience. But the new ones the state is funding are all retail like. Uh, so just there'll be a price per kilogram? Correct. Maybe? Correct. And maybe, you know, maybe you'll have a special card when you swipe it if it's like for Hyundai mm -hmm. that says, don't bill me, bill this other guy. Yeah. So is the target price for the hydrogen fuel comparable to gasoline? On a, on a per mile basis, yes. So if gasoline's at three or four bucks a gallon, um, a price point target at this point is six to eight dollars per kilogram where you get at least two, maybe three times the distance out of the same amount of fuel. So one, one gallon of gasoline is like one kilogram of fuel. It just happens to be the same so energy content. Right. Correct. 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 Yep. Is that sustainable from the you know, air products and those guys, or are they getting incentives to produce every time? So we know from the material handling equipment, so basically fuel stuff forklifts, that they're able to sell fuel in that range or even lower. Um, and so it's, it's just a matter of the whole distribution network and, you know, so those, those stations, they typically do liquid hydrogen and they come and do a big delivery because they're running 100 forklifts, you know, 24 hours a day at warehouses. So this is a different market, different distribution network, and these are typically um, high pressure as opposed to liquid. So there's some differences there, but ultimately from a, a, a product perspective, we can see the, the path toward cost competitiveness with gasoline. And that's from um, natural gas. 
So steam methane reforming where you're taking the hydrogen from the CH4, you're also getting some hydrogen from the H2O as steam. And so it's relatively efficient in the 80%, 85% efficient range. Um, so a relatively good way to use um, uh, natural gas in a in zero emission vehicle. Okay, so that leads me to how else do you get the hydrogen? Um, so here's non-renewable ways. Natural gas, we just talked about SMRs, steam methane reformers. Coal, not a great low carbon way to do it. Um, and nuclear, zero carbon, but other issues. Um, in fact, I just saw something that um, uh, before Fukushima, um, Japan was like 25 or 30 percent nuclear, and now they're like 2 percent or something. They've basically taken them offline. So um, that's a concern for Japan, which had been oriented toward this zero emission uh, path for their fuel cell uh, and their hydrogen. And now they're looking at, well, if we don't have this path, what is our renewable path? So very important to be looking at the renewable aspect of it right now. So how do you get hydrogen from renewables? You can, uh, I talked about you know, the hydrogen and biomass. You can get it out through gasification or other technologies. Or you can do anything that generates electricity. You can split water using electrolyzer. Um, so these are how we're doing it at NREL right now with wind and solar. We're not, we don't have any geothermal at NREL. Um, and you know, this is uh, um, in the range of $5 to $15 per kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, right now it's on the upper end of the spectrum because the fueling stations and the distribution is not really set up to be at capacity, which is where you need for the economies of scale. So from an electrolyzer standpoint, you're basically electricity in to water, you get the hydrogen out, the hydrogen goes into the fuel cell and turns back into water. Exactly. It's, and that's that, it. the efficiency of that transfer process on both ends? Uh, simple question. No, it's, it's a very good question. And it's in the neighborhood of 50 to 60% round trip, which is why it's not um, a great round trip path if all you're trying to do is time shift something. I mean, like if you've got, you know, if you've got excess wind and it's going to, you're going to bend those blades out of the, of the wind anyway and throw it away, it's not bad. But if you're paying a price premium for that electricity from a renewable <coughs> and all you want to do is stick it back on the grid, you better be in a place like Hawaii or someplace where the electricity um, you know, is there's a high demand for that on, on peak where their air conditioners are all running. Otherwise, it's, you know, the energy arbitrage doesn't make sense today with today's economics. No? Have you, has there been a comparison with, uh, say, the, the hybrid vehicles of today versus uh, your fuel cell on kilowatt hours, say, out of a solar panel on your house, all the way to the miles you get out of it, like a kilowatt hours per mile? And what is that comparison that's come out? That's a good question. I, I haven't done that, so I don't know the answer to it. Um, Seems like the best way to compare the different styles of vehicles is energy in, miles out. Sure, sure. And, you know, I, I, I can tell you that solar is an expensive way today to get to a, f a fuel, whether it's electricity or hydrogen, just because the solar uh, electricity is, is going to be more expensive than wind today. Uh, just the economies of scale of putting a one and a half or a three megawatt wind turbine up versus, you know, that equivalent in three kilowatt increments on, you know, hundreds of houses. The economy of scale of wind is just better today. Um, but that's cost so, is coming so down. So kilowatt hours, two miles, so a good comparison with the right. itself. Right, right, right. So uh, I would say today you could probably go further on that electricity from uh, the battery electric path than you could from the hydrogen path. Um, but if you consider that you can't displace every vehicle on the road by doing that, and it's got to be a second or a third vehicle, you know, how many of those vehicles can you actually displace? And so I go back to the, the question of, you know, if you can stick this technology in every vehicle, you can have a significant penetration. If you've got to um, favor only the demographic who can have and afford a second a vehicle or a third vehicle for a, a family, then you're, you're losing a lot of the market. And so your potential penetration is smaller inherently. So. Uh, whoops. So just a couple maps here. I'm not going to dwell on these. We're, we're running uh, low on time. Uh, but just to show where the renewables, uh, our, our country is actually very flush with renewables. And in biomass, it's concentrated kind of in the Midwest and northern part of our, our country. Um, wind is, we've got great resources in the central part of our country and, and on the western side. And then solar, we're kind of the Saudi Arabia of solar. And we've got a great uh, desert over here. Um, and uh, we, we've got good, good solar resource. And if you compare our solar resource to, for example, Germany, which has gone great guns on rooftop solar, 
I mean, they're, they're up like in Canada, and yet they're doing what they're doing, and they're not doing it because it's a good resource there. It's an okay resource. They're doing it because they really believe in the difference they're making by doing it. So, you know, it's, it really comes down to willpower and, and what you want to accomplish. So if you put those all together, our country has tons of renewable potential. And uh, this is just basically showing that solar is, is really good in, in most of the country. Uh, uh, wind is, uh, is great here. Um, oh, and this is, uh, let's see, so we've got good solar, great solar, and wind, and then just a little bit of biomass, uh, where that makes sense up here in New Jersey. And I'm not sure why that popped out, but this is, this is the map we generated. Um, so great uh, renewables in this country, and certainly if we, we wanted to, we could be generating quite a bit of fuel from those renewables. Okay, so what are we doing at NREL? Um, in the area of hydrogen production, we're making hydrogen from um, splitting water through photoelectrochemical. Uh, I'll talk ab about that in, in a slide. Photobiological, basically using algae or bacteria to make the hydrogen for us as part of the metabolism. We're fermenting it, like you'd ferment beer, which makes CO2 but instead you're fermenting it and making H2. Um, we're making it from uh, pyrolysis, uh, basically making an oil from the biomass and then transporting the oil uh, and then splitting or pulling out the hydrogen through a, another process. And then electrolysis, which I've already talked quite a bit about. I'm just gonna briefly have one slide on each of these. Uh, this is John Turner, one of our principal scientists at NREL. He's been working in this technology for 35 years. Um, basically it's, you know, one way you can make um, hydrogen through sunlight is directly by making electrons and splitting the water that way, like you did kind of in high school, high school chemistry class. But uh, photoelectrochemical is actually immersing your electrodes in the water and you're bubbling up the hydrogen and the oxygen um, while being illuminated by sunlight. And so we hold the world's record efficiency of 12.4% of sunlight in and hydrogen out. Now the materials we did, and that was a, a decade or more ago, um, didn't last more than a few hours. Now, in this last year, we actually got those materials to last hundreds of hours. So we've made some breakthroughs in terms of stabilizing the materials, uh, which are very, uh, uh, you know, want to corrode in that environment. So this is uh, showing uh, making uh, hydrogen from algae here, some green algae. And uh, we also are making it from bacteria, basically genetically engineering the bacteria to um, not stop making hydrogen when they're exposed to oxygen. And so we're, we're splicing in genes and doing all kinds of cool science fiction stuff like that. And then finally, I talked about electrolysis. And this is kind of a, a figure of what we're doing at our wind site. With, we've got 10 kilowatts of PV. We've got uh, 50 kilowatts, or sorry, 100 kilowatts uh, wind turbine um, somewhere here. Here it is. And then we've got a bunch of different electrolyzers. And we're splitting water, compressing it, storing it, compressing it to a higher pressure and storing it, and then going in a vehicle. This is at 350 bar. So we're now. Uh, doing the same thing down at our ESIF, our Energy Systems Integration Facility in Golden, but we're going to be doing the higher pressure, the 700 bar. Um, and so that's going to be completed in October of this year, um, and we use solar and wind to make our fuel. And we are hoping at NREL, and this is what we've been working with Steve and others on, is that we will be uh, the seed for other stations as part of a Colorado Hydrogen Coalition. Uh, which is really aiming to bring fuel cell vehicles to Colorado without needing zero emission vehicle regulations. So basically trying to figure out a way to do it with all carrots and no sticks. Uh, which if we can do this, uh, we can really help transition the rest of the country to the same model. Um, because California, there's only so many states that have adopted California's regulations. And so obviously auto companies love this. We're trying to figure out a way to use that love to actually make this happen. Uh, so this is a, a schematic of our uh, energy systems integration facility on the South Table Mountain site. And just to show you where our fueling station uh, is being installed right now, it's kind of on the back here. All the high pressure and uh, hydrogen stuff is kind of on the, the uh, north and eastern side of the building, uh, you know, basically trying to increase the hazards as we go away from uh, uh, the people here in the office tower. And this is our high speed computer in this, in this building here. Just another view of, uh, of the uh, location of the fueling station. Okay, so what are we doing uh, to make this come to market? Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail. We partner with a lot of folks, a lot of car companies in the Detroit area, as well as in the LA area. Um, we already talked about those car companies, but also a lot of academic institutions, <coughs> uh, universities. 
And so uh, as part of that um, industry collaboration, we've brought fuel cell cars to NREL. And this has been key for me um, in, in my vision of how this is all going to play out. And it's also been very instrumental with our management to convince them of what the technology is, what the potential is, and also get them bought into uh, funding additional capability for fueling stations. For example, this is a 350 bar station we built on a shoestring budget of $150,000. Um, ultimately, this led to a uh, million dollar investment for our, our next generation uh, ESIF station. So that was, we had a, a Daimler vehicle here, a Mercedes-Benz A-Class only sold in Europe for a 10 month loan back uh, when we first put in our station. We also, uh, Proterra was a fuel cell bus company down in the Coors uh, Tech Center in Golden. Uh, they've since relocated to uh, South Carolina for economic incentive reasons, but they came up and did a test fill. Uh, we had a one-year lease of an internal combustion engine shuttle bus from Ford um, back in 2010-11. Uh, and then the, the vehicle that you saw in the video, we only had on a six-week loan, really just for uh, some visibility and uh, exposure to it for us. And that was back in 2011, Kia Borrego. And then more recently, uh, two years ago, uh, we brought in the uh, four fuel cell vehicles from Toyota. And these are 700 bar or 70 megapascal capable. And uh, we've been running them around. This is one of the vehicles we have uh, out, out front here. We'll go out and see in a few minutes. And so our partnership with Toyota on this is to basically stutter our fueling infrastructure, uh, look at this renewable hydrogen production pathway, and also do um, somewhat informal studies of the vehicle performance, how they do at high altitude, um, a dry climate here of our, our high desert. And then obviously a lot of uh, outreach to the public and, uh, and our own staff. Um, and you know, basically having four vehicles at our site means that whenever anybody drops by from the media or a VIP, we can guarantee we'll have a vehicle there with fuel that's ready to take them around and show it to them. And that's, that's incredibly powerful. So some people ask me, well, how do you get the vehicles out here if there's no stations between here and Vegas? Well, we do what all the companies did, uh, all the car companies do when they go to auto shows and all that. They stick them in a, in a, uh, a trailer, and this one actually was a, a double-decker, and so the four vehicles came out in, in one truck. Um, and we have them uh, for a couple more months, and then they go back. They actually uh, were first deployed in California and received the zero emission vehicle credits. They have to be there for two or two and a half years. Then once that's done, you check that box, you can relocate the vehicles. And so these vehicles um, came to NREL after that. And then at the end of five years, there's a manufacturer exemption from various uh, DOT re regulations. And at the end of that five years, they have to be, um, go back to Japan or, or be crushed. So we will lo lose these vehicles in a matter of months. Okay, so uh, just a couple more slides here. And uh, um, one of the things we're doing to facilitate the technologies coming to market is gathering lots and lots of data. I talked about the three million miles worth of data from the vehicles. This really gives some confidence um, to our customer, uh, Department of Energy, that the technology is progressing quick enough that they should sustain this investment <coughs> in the technology. And so we basically have public products. Uh, we've got several hundred um, graphs and data results on our website. And then we also have detailed data products that go back to those companies that will actually enable them to um, improve their, their product and their, their research capability. Uh, we're also uh, more recently involved in something called H2 First, which is Hydrogen Fueling Infrastructure Research and Station Technology. It's a, a partnership with another sister la national laboratory in um, uh, Livermore, San Diego National Laboratory. They also have a facility in, in uh, New Mexico, but we're partnered with the one in Livermore. And um, it's basically a DOE project, but it's focused on improving the customer experience with these early fueling stations, <coughs> making sure the technology is robust enough that those first fuelings of those early adopters have good experience, they tell all their friends, it's great, it's just like gas but without the smell. Um, and so this is really uh, driving toward commercially viable hydrogen stations that will provide a, a good customer experience and reduce cost. So um, <coughs> final uh, kind of messaging slide here, what needs to be done still? On infrastructure, we gotta have that good consumer experience, uh, lower the cost, uh, we've got to coordinate that rollout of stations with the vehicles. And we're looking for a non-ZEV state strategy. On the, the vehicle side, things are actually going really well. These companies have invested billions of dollars in the technology, so that's gone very fast. Um, however, there's still opportunities to reduce cost and increase durability. And also, 
uh, outside of just the stack itself, there's lots of other components, blowers and motors and things like that, can always increase those efficiencies. And then finally on the renewable side, which is really the long-term sustainable path we need to be looking at, we need to reduce that cost, make it more competitive with natural gas, which is difficult because natural gas has gotten so cheap. We also need to look at the uh, um, business opportunity and value proposition for companies to invest in this and also potentially engage with utilities to get them on board. And we've actually engaged with Excel Energy, have been working with them at our wind site for the last decade. Okay, so we're to our final slide and the key takeaways from today, which I may or not, may not have already talked about, but these are my strongest messages to you about technology. Fuel cell cars are clean, efficient, refuel quickly, and provide long driving range. Um, auto companies are coming to market with these vehicles. This is actually happening now. Additional support for fueling infrastructure is needed to support these vehicles and make sure that they can roll out as quick as the consumers want to buy them or lease them. There are abundant supplies of clean domestic sources, including natural gas and renewables, which make fuel cells a good choice for the future and in particular for our country. Uh, using hydrogen in a fuel cell vehicle coming from natural gas is originally, or as it is originally, is still more efficient than burning it in an internal combustion engine, which has got, you know, a 20% plus efficiency range versus 60% from a fuel cell car. Remaining re uh, fuel cell research challenges include focusing on reducing cost and increasing durability, which are interrelated. You can make a cheap fuel cell that doesn't last very long, or you can make a really expensive one that lasts a long time. It's that balance of getting the two uh, optimized. And finally, NREL is involved in most aspects of bringing fuel cell cars uh, closer to market, and we talked about all the way from production, storage, uh, to conversion in fuel cells. And so here's a, a pretty picture of our site uh, showing all the, the PV on our roof and uh, our campus, which is now more like a college campus where you park here and then you walk to all the buildings. That's where I was on the site. Right there. Yep. Yep. So yeah, there's 16 uh, chargers, uh, 18 double header GE chargers right in the center of the campus in the prime uh, parking places. Um, and those, uh, that, those electricity is given away for free because the employees are part of the experiment. We're actually looking at how we can reduce our, uh, our peak uh, electricity demand during the day by charging people, uh, charging those vehicles, for example, in the morning and then tapering it off uh, when it's in, in the peak, uh, peak uh, demand in the afternoon for air conditioning. And that's all I've got. So that took me longer than I thought it would, but good, good discussion.